Hi, I'm Kim Gladden, Director of Discipleship, and I welcome you to today's Discipleship Conversation on Racism, Resistance, and Righteousness. I want to thank you for joining us today. You know, this can be a difficult conversation to have, so I am just so grateful for all of you who are tuning in and those who will watch later, and for all of you who've been praying for today's conversation. We recognize that we come with differing views. We've got different passions. We've got different opinions, but there's one thing that unites us, and that's our love for Christ and our Wesleyan affiliation. We are part of the Wesleyan family, and so today it's a family talk. It's a family chat about race, resistance, and righteousness. We're going to talk about it. A couple of things I want us all to note as we get started. For today's conversation, we actually have up to an hour and a half instead of just an hour. We uh, may need to just use some of that additional time due to the nature of the conversation. Also want to let you know that I have scheduled a follow-up conversation on this Thursday from noon to one. And we won't get to cover everything we'd like to cover today, so I've scheduled a second conversation. It'll be a little bit different in that it'll be in a private Zoom room. It won't be recorded. It'll give us some additional truly safe space to talk about what we don't get to cover today. So I'm going to encourage you. You'll be able to sign up in the chat room for that. I'm going to encourage you to, to do so. Uh, go on into the chat room. Tell us where you're listening from. It would be great to know uh, what family members are here today, what churches, what friends we have in the conversation. And uh, finally, I'm going to ask you to listen prayerfully and carefully. I don't know what all will come up in our panel discussion today, but I'm asking all of us, just take a moment, take a breath. Let's just slow down. Let's stop. And let's have a healthy conversation about racism, resistance, and righteousness. You know, we have a great panel today of Wesleyan pastors and leaders, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves, uh, tell where they are from, just take a minute to share their name, where they're from, and their kingdom uh, role that they play. So I want panelists, I want to do it in this order. Uh, Dave Drury, Santi Speedy, Joanne Soldis Walker, Meredith Griffin, Michael Jordan, and Cassius Francis. Let's just greet our audience. Hello, I'm David Drury, and so glad Kim's invited me in with uh, all these wonderful people, my friends. And uh, I am the chief of staff for the Wesleyan Church uh, denominational headquarters, um, and I'm a multi vocational minister. Hey, it's good to be a part of the conversation. Thank you, uh, Kim, for the invitation. Uh, Santis Beatty, uh, we're in Detroit, Michigan at uh, Mosaic Midtown Church. And uh, I'm also the multiplication, uh, multi-ethnic multiplication catalyst for the Wesleyan Church and uh, one of the co-founders of Call and Response Ministries. It's an honor. I am Joanne Solis Walker, and I am coming in live from Marion, Indiana. And I am the founder, uh, co-founder of Camino Road. It's a development agency that focuses on leadership, culture, and praxis. We do consulting work and just journeying along with institutions, academic institutions, churches, and uh, corporate organizations to try and live out to the best our kingdom purposes when it comes to, to culture and leadership. Good day, glad to be here with everyone. My name is Meredith Griffin. Looking forward to the conversation. I am the founding and senior pastor of Harvest Christian Fellowship. We are Wesleyan Church located in Wilmington, Delaware. Good afternoon, my name is Michael Jordan and I'm the Dean of the Chapel at Houghton College and it's my uh, privilege to be with all of you today. Good afternoon and uh, greetings from uh, England. Uh, my name is Cassius Francis. I uh, live in, in Birmingham uh, in England, um, about 100 miles from the capital London. And uh, I'm a, a member of the church board and also lead on responsibility for church planting currently with the Wesleyan Church. Oh, great. As you can see, we just have a wonderful uh, panel who's here today. I want to open our conversation. I'm going to pitch this uh, first question to uh, first Santis, then Joanne, Michael, and Meredith. I want to ask you, how does this moment in our country find you personally? So not just uh, with what you do, but you personally, how, how does this moment find you? 
Satish, why don't you kick it off? Yeah, it's that's a tough question, but a good one, right? Um, if I can be real transparent, it's um, it's like interestingly restless but reflective, um, conflicted but hopeful, <laughs> um, exhausted but encouraged. Like they're like they're all these like commonalities of um, like being in the midst of a pandemic, COVID nineteen, and the realities of racism and how those things kind of merge and uh, are similar, right? Like it's it's everybody's problem. Like the things they spread more quickly when they're not addressed. Um, uh, they they're deadly when you don't pay attention to them, and they're disruptive and they create a new normal, whether you like it or not. And so uh, that's kind of what we're working through, what I'm working through, and trying to um, really sense this, the, how this intersection of what's happening in our society um, comes into dialogue with God's word. And um, like, there's, there's all, always this sense of wanting to uncover what it means to dive into a conversation about race and justice and uh, the police brutality of black and brown people, all that can be overwhelming. Um, but I believe God doesn't put us uh, in a position where there's more than we're able to bear. And so one minute you're, you know, you feel like you're a pandemic expert. The next minute you feel like you have to be a social media and a live streaming expert. And then you have to be a civil rights and a racism expert. Um, but one of the things that's like um, comforting to me is to know that we don't have to be the experts that uh, we, we can take all of this to, to our king. We can take all of this uh, to the throne. And so um, having to walk through the self-care with family as a black man with uh, black children and a black wife, uh, that's a big part of this for me, um, but also trying to pastor my church through this, right? Like this, this has been completely disruptive at one level, but uh, also very life-giving because we are a multi-ethnic church who uh, these conversations are very much a part of our DNA. And so I haven't been exhausted because of what's happening at our church. Like that's been the life-giving part. <laughs> it's been some of the other things that have been a little bit more, uh, a little bit more exhausting. And then I, I think to, to get more directly to your question, like I'm floored by the level of indifference by some, uh, ignorance and then silence. And I, I heard somebody say it this week that really stuck with me. He says, silence is often evil's greatest ally. Um, I'm gonna say that again. Silence is often evil's greatest ally. Um, but when it really comes down to it, like I, I am encouraged because uh, part of me feels like we're, we're, we're beginning to turn a corner and uh, we're beginning to see some things that maybe we've never seen before. And so the optimistic side of me remains hopeful. And, uh, and I believe that there may be some things that I never thought would happen in my lifetime um, that they might actually come to fruition. And so that part of me uh, remains hopeful. Yeah, I'd have to say that I, I echo to the T uh, what Santis has shared with us. Early on, it, when this began to be a real conversation, I found that it was important for me to put some real important boundaries and measures in place for self-care to avoid re-traumatization. Re and uh, that led me to have to make some decisions that I probably would not have done other, under other circumstances, but I had to put the mask on in order for me to be able to do the long haul uh, because this is not a, a something that's going to go away within a matter of weeks. We're gonna keep dealing with this as we approach a season that is gonna be very conflictive in terms of politics and the overlap that this has. And so it was important for me to do that self-care piece for the sake of my family and for the sake of the church and for the sake of my brothers and sisters of color uh, so that I would have the energy and the ability to even come on here uh, today. Some people know my story uh, from back in the days and, and in, even in more recent times and just uh, my work and my personal life lived experiences when it comes uh, to racial trauma. And so uh, that's probably a big word that I wanna echo. Santi said it, you'll probably hear it from all of us. Uh, Self-care is an important part and it is our responsibility to make sure that we put those things in place. Uh, in general, in addition to what's already been said, I have children that are biracial. And so there's this natural concern. You can't help yourself but to be concerned about the well being of your children. And then there's this dose of hope that if we can do anything to really get at the core of these issues and contribute as much as possible so that our children uh, do have a different story to, to narrate and that they're involved in contributing to solution focused approaches, then I wanna be part of, of that. And so addressing the core issues that have continued to 
propagate the behaviors that uh, still keep us down this same path uh, is important uh, to me for the sake of the church, for the sake of our community, for the sake of uh, my brown and black brothers and sisters, um, and for the sake of my family and of myself. Yeah, for me, I think the real challenge of trying to work with college students. So in my role as Dean of the Chapel at the college, I have kind of a pastoral role with students. And uh, I feel like for me, the challenge is uh, the way that this kind of has scrambled all of the categories that were kind of neatly in place before. I, um, many of you who are pastors probably can appreciate this in terms of, you know, we've been separate, separate from each other for so long. Um, and I'm surprised at the kinds of students that I see engaging and the ways that I see them engaging. Uh, on social media, um, <laughs> the kinds of students that I would not have guessed are woke are all of a sudden paying attention to issues of race in ways they weren't before. And it's really, it's wonderful, but I'm trying to sort of sort out, um, okay, for whom is this kind of just a fad? And I need to kind of help them continue to lean into the discussion. Um, who continues to, to need some prodding and cajoling? And as Joanna's pointed out, um, as we get into an election season, all of this is, you know, the temperature is going to be turned up, turned up, you know, 100 degrees. And so how, how are we going to do this in a way that um, keeps, you know, keeps uh, my, my white students and faculty and staff kind of accountable to the discussion in a way that's really healthy and life-giving uh, for everybody involved. So for me, you know, all these issues kind of bleed together and it's a, it's a really, really challenging season. Yeah, I think that I have to concur with a lot of, of what's already been said, but when I think about where this moment finds me personally, the word that I've used over and over again that, that really speaks to where I am is tired. Uh, tired and weary as a 54 year old black man who has experienced these issues myriad times over my lifetime. I go back to being five years old and, and that was the first time that I was confronted with very overt and quite frankly physical racism that here I am now as a 54 year old man who pastors a faith community who in the 13 years of our existence has had on too many occasions to speak of my typical Sunday programming interrupted by the news and what's been going on in our country. And so after this latest uh, murder, of a black man in the street, I stood in front of my congregation, and simply told them I'm tired. I'm, I'm weary both physically, mentally, and emotionally for continuing to find ourselves back in the same place. And as not only a faith leader, but a community leader, but also the father of a 21 year old, almost 22 year old black man, and a 25 year old black woman, I'm afraid. Every time my children leave the house, my wife and I are praying over them and praying until they come back. But while being tired, I really need to say that in this moment, different from moments like this that have occurred in our recent past, I'm encouraged. And I'm encouraged because I see something different happening in this moment. And it takes me back to the last time we had significant racial justice change in our country. This really is a youth led moment. Mm -hmm. And it leads me to be reminded that when Dr. King got to Alabama, he was 26 years old, that by the time he was 39, he was murdered. And so as my wife and I, marched with in protest a group of a thousand plus people in Wilmington, Delaware a couple of weeks ago, we were astounded at the median age being probably, and I'm not good at judging age by looking at folk, but these folk were much younger than me. They were my children's age. And it was encouraging to me that they weren't just walking alongside or marching, but they were the leaders 
of the protests. And so it begins to, to encourage me that there's something going on in this season that's much different. So I'm both tired and weary for yet again, we find ourselves here as a country having to deal with things that we have not yet dealt with, but I'm also encouraged because I see it happening in a much different way. You know, I just want to thank you all for uh, just for sharing as we as we open, uh, because, you know, I've heard from so many different pastors who've said the same thing. I'm, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm, I'm personally tired, uh, encouraged by some of the things I'm seeing, disappointed by other things. But but that issue of being tired. I had one pastor who said he said, I'm on my way to the dentist. And he said, because over these past few weeks, I've clenched my teeth so much. <laughs> <laughs> that I have a physical, I have a physical reaction, and, and I've got to go to the dentist. Uh, a pastor in our chat room just said the burden of being our community's expert on these issues is big for solo pastors like me. And so we we recognize this moment that we were already in a moment when we were dealing with COVID nineteen. We were already in a moment where we were pivoting to online services. We were already in a moment that was that was challenging us, and now we have additional. Uh, additional things that are, that are impacting us. Um, as we just begin with this, this opening, I, I want to turn now to Dave Drury. I know you're here for our opening segment, Dave. And uh, what are you hearing from churches and, and church leaders in this moment? Thanks for asking that. I, I do feel that we, I mean, I think people are sobered. And I know our leadership in the Wesleyan Church is sobered. Wayne Schmidt, our general superintendent and the executive cabinet, and uh, we're we're saddened that we have so far to go in this and uh, grieving. And so I feel as though there's a great sense of um, reverence for the moment, and uh, and even a sense of uh, of repentance and saying we we need to have been farther than we are, and a lot of self reflection. Um, I, I, I think Meredith hit the nail on the head that though there's some sense in saying uh, while we're still here, there's also an encouragement that a lot of people are engaging in a new way. Uh, Michael also mentioned that too among the students. And so while there is a sobered feeling and a sadness, there's also a, this could be different. Uh, at the same time, I hear from some people that like, well, let, let's see how it goes the next six months. Mm -hmm. Are you still gonna be engaged in August and September? Uh, when the next crisis comes. And, uh, and so we need to have a persistence. Um, a great example is up in Minneapolis, the Wait Park Church was an encouraging one for me to hear from. Uh, this was not entirely new to them. They had already been engaging uh, in their community. They had already, for instance, invited uh, the choir of a historic black church to sing at their church, which introduced their people to one another. They then ended up canceling their services of their church and joining the services of a historic black congregation nearby there uh, to submit to their worship and be a part of that and build relationship and eat together after the service. So when this came around, it wasn't brand new for them. And it reminded me, of course, but their church felt they started too late. And so theirs became an example of many of the churches now that have shared what it is that they are doing. We're actually able to collect, uh, Kim, to answer your specific question, a list of what Wesleyans are doing about racism. Uh, people can just Google uh, what can we do about racism and the word Wesleyan and you'll find it. Uh, and it's a stunning list of what our brothers and sisters are doing to humbly connect with each other, to intentionally learn from people that are farther ahead from, than them in the conversation and to consistently act. And so I just feel like it's, it's, I have had that sense of encouragement that people are actually engaging. And the, the last thing I would say is this is just a reminder that this is a discipleship conversation. Kim, you do these discipleship conversations all the time. This is not off topic for those of us that are followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, issue, you know, engaging in the question of race and, and the justice issues in our world is a part of our discipleship. It's a part of us learning from one another and growing more like Christ, who is different than me. Uh, and so that's part of what I'm seeing out there, uh, Kim. And I'm in, I, I do have that sense of uh, weariness out there, but also a lot of encouragement, like Meredith said. 
Hey, thank you for uh, for sharing that. Just want to remind everyone that uh, you can also put your questions and your comments uh, in the chat room. We have uh, room for a variety of opinion, a diversity of opinion. So feel free to, to enter as we're moving along through the conversation. Feel free uh, to enter and to, to express yourself. We want to extend grace to one another during this conversation. Uh, Cassius, I want to turn to you now. I am... Um, I turned on my TV one day and I see a throng of people in London, England, uh, protesting. So I want to ask, as we're just opening up this discussion, how have recent events in our country, how is it that they captured uh, attention outside of the U.S.? Yeah, I think um, it, it's really been uh, a time, not just in, in London, Kim, we've had protests across uh, the country. Uh, so as I said, I, I live in Birmingham, 100 miles from uh, London, the capital city. We've had protests here. Um, we've had protests in uh, Wolverhampton, uh, other places uh, around England with significant uh, minority populations, ethnic minority populations. Um, but what has uh, really struck me with uh, the protests uh, this time, because we have had protests before, as we've heard from our other speakers in, in the States, we've had other protests in, in England. Um, there have been communities where there are not huge um, Black and Asian or, or minority ethnic populations who have been engaged in, in protests. So um, a, a place called Hereford, where my, my wife uh, used to work, um, uh, predominantly white young people uh, taking the knee and um, really expressing solidarity um, and wanting to stand against racism. Um, so that has uh, that that has 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 been uh, encouraging to me. Um, just following on from what I think Meredith was saying earlier, this sense that actually um, there are young people who are really engaging with this issue who really want to see change um, but I think it is it is also because we are recognizing um, a connection with you know what has 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 been happening in the states um, it, it is a, a time when we've been talking about the overrepresentation of uh, black Asian and minority ethnic communities with our COVID statistics here um, yesterday uh, was a day when we celebrated uh, Windrush, the coming of people from the Caribbean to England, um, but also uh, lamenting the fact of um, just some of the challenges that many people have faced over the years in, in, um, in opposing racism uh, and discrimination. So it, it has certainly captured uh, attention uh, across the the UK and and not just uh, as I say with uh, with black and and brown communities. Thank you, Kashish. You know when we uh, began a conversation uh, about race, I want to I want to toss this question. I think maybe I'll toss it first to uh, uh, Santis and Meredith. What do you see current events revealing about race relationships in the U.S.? I've heard a number of uh, pastors saying, um, you know, I was kind of taken surprise by surprise by uh, these recent events. And I just want, what do, you, what do you see emerging? What do you see that has bubbled up about race relationships um, in the U.S.? So, Santis, I'm going to throw it to you first. Yeah, I think, um, well, I think that the obvious one, right, is like, we got a long way to go, <laughs> right? Like, um, we're not as far as we thought we were, and, um, and, and we got a long way to go. I think uh, I, I would just echo our young people are not going to let us stay where we've been. Um, and we have a, a lot of people like coming through. I talk about this whole continuum of, um, you know, and, and in the middle section of the continuum is color blindness and color, uh, uh, cultural blindness and cultural precompetence. Like we have a lot of people moving into cultural precompetence and that's the stage where you start to become aware, you're overwhelmed by it, you begin to see the problem through new eyes. And um, as people are becoming aware, they're becoming overwhelmed and they 
um, they'll have a choice to make. And that choice is like either you, you move forward into a place of competence or you kind of fall back into a place of, of blindness again, where, where it's easy and where it's comfortable. And, um, and, and I, I've been asking myself, like, like, what's different about this time? And, I, you know, some, some will uh, point to our young people. Some will point to social media. Um, but I also think that one of the things that's happening that's different this time is we are we are we have seen a shift here in our demographics in our country, um, th and that shift has very little to do with immigration, but it, ha it has everything to do with the birth rate of people of color, biracial, multiracial children, and uh, and and the next twenty years will be a majority minority nation, and we're starting to feel the the, the power of that shift like we've never felt it before. And, and so there's a way in which that has to be lifted up. I think the second thing I'd say is I'm, I'm also watching the church and I'm watching, uh, particularly in a, a political season and everything that's happening with our, uh, from the politics to sports and really seeing um, come into focus this difference between nationalism and patriotism, right? And so nationalism is this, this idea of loving one's country uh, supporting its ideals, uh, but sometimes at the expense of another country, right? This whole like it or leave it, love it or leave it mentality. And then patriotism is that same feeling, but it, it doesn't come with the expense of another nation. Uh, it actually comes in a way that loves the nation into a place of change and transformation. And so it wants to uh, ask the nation or ask the people to live up to its creed. And unfortunately, much of our world and, and sometimes the church has made those two terms, nationalism and patriotism synonymous and they're not. And, and what I'm finding right now is uh, what some people thought was patriotism uh, has been shrouded in nationalism and is being exposed. And, and that exposure has created a great deal of defensiveness, a great deal of denial, um, and, but also for some people, a great deal of transformation. And so, uh, I'm, I'm loving the, the level of engagement that I'm seeing, the level of excitement that people are leaning into these conversations. And, and I'm prayerful that uh, we'll, we'll see uh, more of that unfold over time. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with what Santis has said. Um, for me, one of the things, and, I, and I'm appreciative for the space we're in now and the capacity to have a place where we can have what I believe are very vital conversations about this, but what also can at times be very necessary and uncomfortable conversations about these things. When I when I hear this statement, you know that that you made, Kim, that some pastors say they are surprised by these events. I, I think my response to that is that to me is part of the issue that's being uncovered here now, right? And, and so for me, I'm not surprised. For me, I think that what we have become accustomed to doing is believing that a little change has changed the whole thing. But this is kind of reveal that the more things change, the more things stay the same. And so what, what we're finding in, in this moment is that our country has not yet dealt with what is by many considered its original sin. And that race relations and racism and white supremacy and all of those things that we would place into that box, we really have to, both as a country, meaning all of the institutions that make up our country, including the Christian church, have to really make the spaces and opportunities where we can come under the auspices of all that we know as believers in Jesus Christ and really not only talk about them, but begin to plan how do we live out the mandates of our faith and become agents of transforming the culture that we live in into the culture that glorifies him. I went to college as an undergraduate at Hampton University, which literally is were it not for I-64, I would be able to see from my dorm Point Comfort, Virginia, which is now at Fort Monroe, 
which is the place where those first 20 kidnapped Africans came on their way to enslavement at Jamestown. Well, what, what's the point that I'm making there? The point that I'm making is much of what we're dealing with now is baked into the system and the systems of our country. And so there are those of us who have by socioeconomic status or how we grew up or where we grew up have been able to remove ourselves at some level from what's happening in other parts of our country. But there are parts of our country that when, when they would hear the statement that I'm surprised by what's going on right now, they'd say, this is how I live every day. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm confronted with every day. Mm -hmm. This is, and I think much of what we're seeing in the streets and in the neighborhoods and in the protests in our country right now are that those segments of our population that we as believers in Jesus Christ are called to love just like Christ loved them and that many of them are already our brothers and sisters in Christ, they're saying enough is enough. My voice needs to be heard and it's time for us to rise to change the system. And, and so to Santee's point, I think one of the things that ought motivate us and one of the things that we can be encouraged by and one of the things that these conversations then have to morph into is what becomes our role as the church, the institution, as believers in Jesus Christ, as God's redeemed community owning his mission that we can jump into that. But what, to, to answer your question bluntly, because I'm a preacher and I could go on all day long, <laughs> to, to answer your question quite bluntly, to me, it reveals that the things that we sweep under the rug or the things that we tried to put a nice cover on won't stay there always. Mm -hmm. And unless and until we as a culture and a country say we really want to deal with these issues as uncomfortable as they may be, that we can get beyond them. Let's make it, let's put it in terms we can understand. There can be no reconciliation or restoration without repentance. And, and so there has to be a recognition so that we can get to repentance so that rest, reconciliation and then restoration can begin. Can I add just one thing, yeah, Kim, to that? Uh -huh. I think um, one of the things that's, that's coming out of this, and, and this, is, this is historical in the, in the context that we, we've seen this before, like, and when I used to do uh, diversity and racial, racial reconciliation workshops, we would put a line and, um, and put uh, like a date, a timeline. And then we would ask people to put like racism on top of the, uh, the line and then put resistance below it. And, and to kind of chart history and see where, where have you seen racism? And anytime you see racism, you will also see a heightened level of resistance. And anytime you see a heightened level of resistance, you'll always see more racism, <laughs> right? And so th there's this pattern, more, more racism, more resistance, or more resistance, more racism. And, and what it does, particularly in an age of social media, is it puts everything on front street. Like one of the challenges of the civil rights movement was they had to posture themselves in a way that would create an opportunity for the world to see what was happening. And now the, the accessibility to what's happening is far greater. And so not only are we seeing resistance at a high, high, heightened level, we're also seeing racism at a heightened level. You know, just, you know, talking about NASCAR with the, the noose and Bubba uh, Wallace's uh, 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 place where he, you know, was, was, was changing his clothes. Like that's a heightened racism. But then you see the next day um, that these, um, NASCAR drivers and their, you know, all of the people with their team now are resisting it. And so what's happening now is we're seeing more racism and we're seeing more resistance and it's keeping the conversation going where now, previously it was okay to be silent, right? It was the, the thing to do was to not talk about it. Now, when you're, when you're in this constant mode of heightened racism and heightened resistance, the, the thing you don't want to do is be silent. <laughs> and so now it's creating a new culture where people who used to be silent and say it's going to pass over, we're going to deal with it later, are now saying, oh man, like, like I can't in good conscience not say something. And it's just a different, it's a different day. And, uh, and I'm, I'm excited about that reality of forcing there to be a level of vocalization to this and not just sitting 
and resting in silence. I, I have to say this because I, I think that that Santee's made an important point that I think we we can glean from history in this, right? So when we think about what began to, for those who had been marching and sitting in and protesting during the 50s and 60s, um, my parents' generation, one of the turning points was when all of a sudden, because news cameras made their way from the North to the South, that people in the North saw fire hoses and dogs and police on black protesters in the streets, all of a sudden, much of America that said, that's not our issue, we can't see it out of sight, out of mind, was now forced to deal with. We actually have a system that says this is okay. We have a system that supports this. And much in the same way now that everyone is literally opening up an app and hitting a button away from being a live news reporter, we now have a country and I'd say a world that is now being confronted with images of systemic brutality and racism that is causing harm to not only the psyche, but the bodies of black, brown, yellow, and other people worldwide, which is why it, it is resonating in the UK and in Germany and in France and around the globe, because this isn't an American issue. Th this is a human issue that we're dealing with all around the world. I just had to say that. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. Listen, you know, we are, we're just uh, into this conversation and we're already falling way behind schedule. But I want to say there are so many comments and questions coming to the chat room. We appreciate those. We are, it is quite clear that we're not going to be able to get to every, all of them. And so I want to remind you of our follow-up conversation that is offline, off record, our safe space that we've created for Thursday. Because I can, I can tell we're, we're, we're not going to get to all of the things we hope to. Keep those questions coming. The ones that we don't get to today, we're gonna, we can put those into the Thursday conversation. But so I'm, I, there's so many that come in, I've got to go way back up in the chat line and, 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 and grab one that kind of dovetails to what Meredith was saying. And here's a, a, a listener who's saying, how, how do you engage in conversation with congregants who think that uh, racism is a non-issue? I want to ask that to our panel. I'm throwing that out to the panel. So, 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 how do you engage in a conversation if you have congregants in your congregation and they just think this, this is a, this is why are we, why are we talking about this? This is a, this is a non-issue. I mean, to me, it's always been about trying to find ways of amplifying voices that are unusual for people in that place, right? So, I, I mean, I don't know who asked the question and what their, where their context is, um, but I know that I have. Uh, many students who come to Houghton, which is in a rural part of the world, who have not had a lot of experience um, in diverse communities. And so for them, um, you know, they, they have kind of equated um, being nice with being righteous about this. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm a good person. I, um, I have black friends. I mean, these kinds of lines, um, the, the idea that, that racism somehow exists as this kind of uh, evil, ghost that somehow, you know, that's not me. That's, that's, I, I couldn't be that. Um, and finding ways to put in front of those folks, voices from different communities who are willing to, as, as, um, as Meredith has said, kind of highlight that these are, these are gospel issues. These are things that, you know, it, it should uh, drive all of us, um, you know, even, even if we are not from a particularly diverse community, it should trouble us that there are segments of our world where people are treated in the ways which are increasingly hard to deny. And so for us to be consistent, um, to be as winsome as we can be, but also to be really not compromising in the fact that we're gonna continue to lift up these voices so that we can really move to um, being a unified body. I get very tired of people who accuse that kind of speech of being fractious or divisive when they just haven't really realized that unity that can't tolerate any talk about this is not really a strong unity. <laughs> That's a very small thing. And so if we're gonna really be unified, it means drawing the circle wider and learning to listen to different voices. And so I'm, I'm pretty uncompromising in, in lifting those voices up to our students. 
I think coming from a different perspective that there's a lot of value in knowing that someone actually finds themselves there. I, I would much rather know that someone uh, hates me because of my skin color than to have someone pretend that they are in brotherly or sisterly relationship with me mm -hmm. and, and then behave in a different way. And so I, I actually feel that while unexcusable, and undeniable, and, and it, it does inform about the discipleship. It does inform about the starting point. It does inform about the kind of conversations that I can engage with with this person. And so uh, it, it also tells me how to introduce uh, some concepts and what role storytelling plays and what I invite this person to, to engage because I still part from the premise that I don't wanna leave you where you're at. Uh, for the sake of your soul, for the sake of the kingdom of God, I have a responsibility to love you enough to want to share my story, to want to share the story of others, to want to help you broaden your, your worldview and your paradigm to understand what are some of the real core issues and how they're not just uh, made up stories or something that someone is broadcasting. Uh, I think what Meredith said, what, you know, everybody's a reporter these days. You've got an iPhone or any kind of camera phone. Uh, you just became a, a reporter. And when these things begin to be documented and can be documented one right after the other, you have to be, especially as a Christian, you have to assume a Christian posture to ask yourself, what is going on that I don't have eyes to see? And so this is part of the truth. You shall know the truth, the truth will set you free. And so embracing the, the truth is, is really at the core of the work that I feel we are called to do as, as leaders, as disciplers, as people who are trying to lock arms with others and not leave them where they're at. And that doesn't mean that you excuse the behavior, it means you confront it. <laughs> and in confronting it, you expose uh, the truth and you expose the biases and you help then bring clarity to the things that may not be as clear to some people. I think that's a great question because I do believe that a major part of the church does find itself there. And while there has been responses and protests, uh, the role of the church is still uh, overall not what it should be. It has been society within itself that it's taking the stand. And so we still have much to work to do as the church to lead. Um, but if we don't begin to view this as our problem and even as contributors uh, to the problem, then we won't be able to address it or partake in it like God would expect or is calling us to do. So we miss the opportunity in reality to be the people of God and to preach the gospel that we believe in because it's a shaded gospel. It's not the gospel of Jesus Christ that allows us to love each other enough to, to have and engage in those hard conversations. Some, something that I've been using a lot lately that has been really practical for a lot of uh, churches and maybe a lot of individuals is there's a video called the backwards bicycle um, where a guy, uh, the, the one thing that's changed with the bicycle is that when he turns the bike right, it turns left. And when he turns it left, it turns right. And um, basically he can't ride the bike because he's learned to ride it the, the normal way. And what's really powerful about the video is that it says that knowledge does not always equal understanding. And that what happens is he has to practice. He has to practice with this new way of riding the bike. And it takes him eight months <laughs> to learn how to ride this bike as he practices about five to 10 minutes a day. And what I love about the video is it reminds me that some people are not grabbing hold of this, not because of a lack of effort, not because of a lack of desire, but simply because they, they don't know that this is a new way of riding, right? This is, and we're not asking you to forget the old way. We're asking you to learn a new way so that you can now ride the bike both ways. And, and that is such a, a revelation that sometimes comes, like this is not because you're a bad person, it's simply because this is work and you may have to lean in and practice this, but as you do it, there's this moment where he learns to ride the bike the new way. And, and then he, he also is able to adapt and ride it the old way. And that's what we want from people is to learn how to ride the bike both ways and not just one way. Kim, can I piggyback on that just a little bit with what Santis has said? I, I, and I really appreciate Santi's point. I really want to encourage, I don't, again, I don't know who asked the question, but I really want to encourage uh, white pastors who find themselves in that position to kind of do some of that work. <laughs> um, 
it, it's very kind that Santi sort of wants to sort of say, like, I recognize uh, that you're a good person, that you want, you know, that you, it's it's more that you don't know than that that you're not kind of disposed rightly. But I can understand, and I think what we're seeing on the streets now is uh, people of color less inclined to do that. And that's understandable. Just to say, I'm tired, I'm angry, I don't want to have to work, Yeah, I don't want to have to walk through one more time telling white folks like I see your essential goodness I see that you're you know we can we have to do I think I'm talking to the white pastors here to do that work of saying like I recognize that that you're a good person and I see that about you but this is something we need to work on together or other people really aren't going to see it I just um I don't want to put Santis out of a job because that's part of what he does is build those bridges but I really want to see white pastors take a stronger role in that in bearing a little bit of that of that burden and that brunt so yeah, yeah. I, I think just because what, what Mike was just saying really ties in with what Joanne said, right? That That's part of our role if we really want to say that we're in biblical community with each right. other. I can't allow you to stay where you are. And, and so I think sometimes and too often we back away when it can sometimes be uncomfortable uh, with the conversation rather than saying, listen, I get it. And Joanne spoke it very well when she talked about, so that's where relationship and me sharing my story with you and having others share stories with you. Because if you say to me, you don't see it, how much time you got, right? <laughs> so I can share my stories or bring in people who can share with you innumerable stories that will let you know again that it's baked into the culture and there's a privilege that may allow you to get by not seeing it let me share with you where it is i understand santee's point that it's an ignorance meaning without knowledge so now let me educate you and mike i hear you saying and you ought to be willing to step in a place where you want to learn and let me say this like thank you michael for that i appreciate uh, you saying that one of the most loving things white people can do is to have the conversation without us yes like, and I think that's what you're getting at. Like one of the most yep. loving things we can do is to not ask me to share my story again. I think what Joanne said very early was to be re-traumatized sometimes by having to tell our story over and over again. But one of the most loving things we can, that white folks can do is learn how to have the conversation without us. And, uh, and that, is, that is a huge piece of, of the journey. Hey guys, let me jump back in here and say that uh, we, we have just a vigorous, um, Vigorous comments coming in. So thankful for all of you who are commenting in the chat room. Uh, we're not going to be able to get to, to all of them, but let me just, just want to read a few things that have come in, have our panelists respond. Um, uh, one of the comments that came in, and as we talk about the, 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 the hard work, we talk about the, um, I need, let me just read a couple of these because I, I, I just want to get some of them in. And uh, one that, uh, oops, long scrolling. <laughs> One said, how do you, how do you, how do you, I'm scrolling, they keep coming as I'm, as I'm reading, uh, how, how, how do you engage, oh no, we did that one, uh, someone was saying that in, in, in their church, they were told, uh, let's not talk about uh, racism, because we don't, we don't have any racists here. Um, another comment that came in uh, was asking, uh, how do we, um, how do we engage with congregants who believe that talking about uh, racism actually makes it worse because it's bringing too much attention to it. How do we respond to that objection? And uh, we've all heard the term uh, race uh, baiting. And so um, how would you, you know, just the, these are real conversations. These are real um, things that folks are wrestling with in this moment as we try to pastor, as we try to disciple folks. Anybody want to just respond to those uh, two things? Well, I mean, I think we need to think about who silence benefits and how. So uh, it's kind of, uh, my students get tired of hearing me talk about this because I, I really believe that a lot of theological problems are more ecclesiological. They have to do with our doctrine of the church, our understanding of the church. So um, silence can preserve the unity of a congregation at the expense of a wider unity with the church. And I can understand, I mean, this is part of what we're talking about here. There's a powerful pull 
for monoethnic congregations to not talk about this because it allows people to kind of go into their own separate corners, their own prayer closets and decide what they think about it as long as they don't talk about it together. The, the hard thing about it, the sad thing about it is though that unity comes at the expense of really being able to embrace someone whose experience is really different. And so from my perspective, again, that, I, that's how I process this as I'm in my place at the college is these are things that people need to know about because we live in a, in a diverse and complicated world. And what, they, what people do to each other, not just the people that we can see, but the people that we can't see, especially those that we're in communion with, we, we owe people uh, that, that kind of difficult conversation. So that's how I understand it anyway. We just trade off one kind of unity for another. And it's a very small kind of unity that's gained by silence at, at the expense of a really big and rich unity. Um, that we're all going to be forced into one day and i look forward to that day when god sets things right so i want to move the conversation along um i want to talk a little bit about we said racism but what about resistance and uh i want to talk because there have been such differing reactions to to resistance i want to talk a little bit um cautious real briefly i want to start with you let's go back our, our church and churches in in england um you actually, your district superintendent, Reverend Ruth Lowe, put out a, a, a statement in a video concerning recent events here in America. Now, here's a, here's a DS in London <laughs> who feels compelled to, to, to put out a video from London. So I, I just real briefly, uh, cautious, what compelled you all to join in the conversation? And then after Kasha speaks, I want to ask our panel, how can we process what's going on in our country in terms of resistance? So Kasha real briefly, and then let's get to that a discussion about how, how do we process? What are some things that we are tools that we use to process what we're seeing in, in our country in terms of resistance? Yeah, I have to um, say that, uh, you know, it was uh, a huge encouragement to me to know that uh, not just Reverend Ruth as our district superintendent, but um, one of our pastors, our youth pastor, actually, um, David White, um, really felt strongly um, that we should put out a clear statement as a church about what we were, the, event, the events that we were witnessing. Um, and, I, and I think for a couple of reasons, so, someone said uh, earlier that, you know, silence really in... Uh, this situation with the with the environment and and the things that are taking place um, is is not really a, an option for us as uh, followers of Jesus. I think people are looking, uh, particularly our young people, um, are looking for us um, as Christians to to be clear about what we are saying into this situation. How are we going to respond? Um, so I, I, I think the statement was, was really important. Uh, and I know that lots of statements have been made, but what, what was really helpful to me was that it was a statement of intent. It was clearly saying some things that we need to be doing as a church to be engaging with these issues. So um, we, we have issues in our own criminal justice system um, with an overrepresentation again, of our um, black and brown young people. Um, and we recognize that we need to be more engaged in that um, at a local level. We need more people in our schools uh, as governors. Um, we, you know, we, we need to be making sure that we are as, as tired as we are. And, and I hear that from uh, my brothers and my, my sister uh, there, that there is a sense of being tired, but um, what keeps me going is when I see our young people, when I see my God children, when I see my nephews and nieces, and really not wanting them to have to revisit the situation that we are seeing now in, in 10, 20 years time. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry if that's a bit longer than you wanted, Pastor Kim, but uh, that, that's why it was really important for us. Uh, to make a statement and, and draw a line, if you like, in the sand to say, you know, what we're seeing, uh, we, we clearly stand against uh, any racism, any prejudice, um, uh, and, and make a clear, a clear stand. 
Thank you, uh, Kasha. Some folks are asking if there's a way to put a link to that statement in the, in our chat room. If you put it in our chat room, we'll get it over to the to the main chat. Sure, um, I'll do that. Another person is saying we need a, a part two with the same panel Thursday, Thursday at noon. <laughs> we we're gonna we we are not gonna get through everything. Let's get back to resistance and let's talk about how are we processing what's going on in the country in terms of of resistance panel. Well, I think um, one of the things that's happening, of course, is protests, right? Is people uh, exercising their right to disrupt um, what's happening normally in society to bring attention to an issue. And I think protesting has its place. I think uh, also what is resistance is uh, really pushing people, particularly in a, a year of, of elections uh, to register and to go vote. Um, to exercise uh, the power of the vote. Uh, that will, will be a huge form of resistance. I think simply having these kinds of conversations is a form of resistance. And so whether they be in your own family, uh, whether they be uh, at your dinner table, whether they be in your community, um, that these are forms of resistance. And, and I think there's also the piece of uh, beginning to ask the question, how, how does our table and how does um, our infrastructure currently uh, exist and are there ways we can change it, uh, ways we can tweak it where these things are at the forefront of the DNA of who we are? Like that is a form of resistance. And what I mean by that is looking at policies, uh, the systemic approach that you have to hiring, um, the, the way in which you engage in who you read and who you study and who you listen to, um, uh, that is a form of resistance. I will never forget one of my mentors, the first woman mentor I ever had, asked me to go home one day and look at my bookshelf. And I'm an avid reader and she knew it. And I went back to my bookshelf and she said to me, I want you to pull off the bookshelf every book written by a woman or not written by a white or a black man. And, um, and so I went back to my bookshelves and I started pulling off books a little bit, you know, like, you know, thinking, what does, she, what does she know? You know, I had my little attitude and I went back and I did it. And as I was pulling off books, I sat down in my desk chair and just began to weep um, because what she, the question she asked was a form of resistance. And it caused me to go and do some reflection. And I think one of the things that I've learned uh, and I'm learning is sometimes in the midst of what's happening, all we need to do is ask some really important questions and the people who are really serious about the work will, will, will see it as a, a, not only a form of reflection, but it will become an act of resistance. And so sometimes we need to do what Jesus did, tell a story, ask a question and, and leave it to the Holy Spirit to do the transforming, but it can become a form of resistance. And I, I would I would piggyback on that. Kudos. I would definitely piggyback on that by saying, and then tell a story again and ask a question. Because I think one of the things that ultimately we're resisting is we're resisting what is the natural bent towards going back to a place of complacency, right? That would make this just a moment rather than a movement. And so we'd find ourselves back here again. So the questions we have to be asking ourselves first individually, then in all of the places we inhabit in community is what are we going to do different that is going to allow us to resist the very natural bent that things are going to go back to what we consider normal, which would mean for those marginalized communities, those communities that are experiencing the very racism and things that we're talking about it's going to go back to the way it was for them, but we will be comfortable. I think it's going to, for us as clergy persons, us, those of us who stand in front of people on a consistent basis as either preachers or teachers, is going to mean that we're going to have to affirm and then reaffirm uh, the notion and probably kill another notion for some people that when we look at the early church, it literally was a countercultural revolutionary movement. 
And so what we have to ask ourselves is in what ways today are we countercultural or are we simply part of the system that has been doing the things that are going on right now? Remember that the early church was persecuted because it wasn't falling in line with what everybody else considered. And so I think that we now need to begin to ask ourselves those kinds of questions. Am I Am I more committed to being comfortable? Am I more committed to the people who are in front of me every Sunday being comfortable? Or do I, back to Joanne's earlier point, do I want to make sure that we are committing ourselves to being God's redeemed community, which means that I'm going to be pushing those who are in front of me every week in our loving relationships as part of this community to be the walking, talking, living, breathing expressions of Jesus Christ and the kingdom he came to install everywhere I go. And that in and of itself, I believe, is resistance, right? Because I, I just want to, I just want to come to church and, and check that off my list. I, I want to come to church and be known as a good person. I want to sing the songs. I want to be able to say they're black folk in my church or they're white folk in my church. Look at us. We've got this thing right. But if we're not having the conversations that are transforming the community and culture around us, do we? Because that actually is our call by God to go and be the witnesses broadly of what it looks like where we are. Nay, nay, you didn't ask for the amen, but you're going to get it, brother. <laughs> There's a term that's called moral licensing, and, and it's exactly what Meredith just described. It's this, uh, this idea that uh, we can check off all these boxes, that we can do all these things that demonstrate just how culturally competent we really are. But when the dust dies, dies down, when things pass, then we go and revert right back to the very same behavior as we had before and so now we're we're not we're not moving forward in any form or fashion the work that has been done and so i want to reiterate the importance of asking ourselves the questions over and over again of doing the storytelling of going to those narratives and then asking ourselves and measuring the progress that we are, are doing and if you're wondering what some of those questions are you have to ask yourself as a church as an institution as an organization as an individual you know who are you serving who are those people who is your audience who are the people that you are are serving and who are you silencing? Who are you marginalizing, right? Who's not legitimate in, in, in your eyes? And who has the positions of power? Uh, so you can have a congregation full of, of different people from different ethnic backgrounds, but if your leadership is still the same color, there, there are questions that you need to ask to confront yourself. And you have to be at a posture to allow those questions to be confrontational and, and look at the moral values, look at the norms, look at the different perspectives. What are the policies, you know, uh, Santi's referenced this, you know, what, how are, what are the systems that are being uh, evaluated? At, at the end of the day is who are, who are, what are the interests that become important? What is it that the institution is protecting? Is it self-preservation? right is it just protecting because we we can't deny right uh, the the church as a whole the western church is from an individualistic uh culture and so coming from an individualistic culture you know preservation seeking to defend itself it's part of of the natural uh norm i'm not even saying that from a negative connotation it just is part of the individualistic culture so self-preservation protecting itself and moving to the defense and topics like this that we're addressing is the natural posture. I, I've got to defend myself. I got to explain to you why I don't have white privilege, why, why white supremacy is not in agreement with me and the, and the why, why, why. From a more collectivistic culture where uh, people of color come from, it's, it's not about me as an individual. It's about us. It's the collective grief. It's the concern about how this is impacting all of us. That's why you're seeing teens for equality rise up and say, man, no more. We have seen, we have experienced the trauma, not only of our own, but of uh, those who came before us. And it's coming to this realization that as a church, sometimes we're not talking the same language. We're thinking from an individualistic perspective and this other group is thinking from a collectivistic perspective. And until we come to a place where we're on the same platform or at least willing to engage in the conversations, hearing the the voice of the others, we don't progress. 
and we will move to that moral licensing. That's why asking the questions is important, allowing them to confront and asking ourselves over and over again, what are the stories that we're not hearing? Who are the people that we're not listening to? What is it that we're silencing will be imperative moving forward. It is not a one step. It is cyclical because this is systemic <laughs> and because it is embedded and because it is embedded in a way that we're biased to and we may not always have the opportunity. Our white brothers and sisters may not have the, the opportunity to understand just how embedded it is. And therefore, that's why the questions and the narratives and the storytelling and the questions and the narrative and the storytellings are, are important. And that's why it's a journey. Again, one that we should do locking arms with each other because at the end of the day, this is about the kingdom of God. This is about our purpose as a church. Don't get me excited, Meredith. <laughs> See what you did, oh, shame on you. <laughs> Can I throw out a term that we use? Real quick, we go ahead. Use in other spaces that I think matters in this space and, uh, and it's bullying. Um, bullying is like this unwanted aggressive behavior that involves like a uh, perceived power imbalance that's repeated multiple times. And, uh, and what I'm finding is one of the ways there can be resistance is bullying is happening around this issue all the time. Like you can see it, you can see it on Facebook with threads, you can see it and how people are responding uh, to people individually. And one of the things that we say to our children is we say to them, you should stand up to a bully. Mm. Like you should speak on the behalf of somebody else that's being bullied. You, you should report it to the proper teacher or administrator when somebody is being bullied. And what I found is that there is bullying happening right now. It's happening in the church. It's happening outside of the church. Like I can't tell you how many like little uh, messages I get from people and, and they, they think they're trying to do, you know, the good thing, but like I see inherently in the message, a little bit of bullying trying to silence me. And, and there's this sense in which we need, part of our resistance is calling out bullies <laughs> and saying no. And, and just because somebody put uh, their knee on somebody's neck, that's not the only kind of bullying that's out there. Like there are other ways to bully people, to silence them, to try to prevent them from talking to prevent them from, from exploring. I, I, I listened to uh, a pastor exploring this yesterday about white privilege on Facebook. And then I watched a barrage of other white pastors, like almost like hyenas on a, a carcass, just devour. And I tried to speak into that and say, keep working, keep, keep leaning in, keep asking these kinds of questions. But what I saw was bullying and we are not calling it out. And one of the forms of resistance is calling out bullying when we see it. Let's, uh, let's take the conversation. We've, we've spoken a little bit about um, racism, resistance. We didn't get to, uh, one of the things I wanted to do was to explore some of the uh, more uh, explosive terms and just, but we don't, we did, we'll have to maybe save that for Thursday because I wanna move on to, uh, to righteousness. What are the biblical mandates that impact this moment? And uh, how, what does this moment, what role does discipleship play in faith formation that informs our life in the world? So I'm, I wanna ask the panelists to, uh, to jump onto that. I wanna talk yeah. about biblical mandates. I heard a voice. Yeah, so I think I'm glad you're bringing that up, Kim, because I, we as Wesleyans need to understand there's a unique Wesleyan way of engaging this conversation. And almost anybody that's looked into what it means to be a Wesleyan or the Wesleyan history would probably um, immediately say, yes, this is part of our history. This is part of our DNA. We, we do have the discipleship conversation, but our discipleship conversation, our righteousness conversation lends ourselves to things that are in the broader culture and the counterculturalism that Meredith mentioned before. Being a Wesleyan means eventually, and we can't expect somebody that just came to Christ, somebody that just showed up at our church is to get this right away. It's hard. Every, every pastor is not just dealing with COVID, but they're dealing with a great variety of perspectives in their own church that can be very difficult. So it's not as though this is easy. It, you're going to get tired like the rest of the people talk about on this panel with, with this. And you know what? Just keep pressing in. It really is a matter of saying that broader cross uh, countercultural stuff is is a part of what we are 
And so it's in our abolitionist history, in our suffragist history, we were doing things that that the broader culture around us didn't want. And so, and it's even presently in that we're a denomination that ordains women and preaches. We've got Pastor Kim and Pastor Joanne here, both reverends and reverend doctors who are leading us and we submit to your leadership. That is countercultural amongst the evangelical church in many spaces. We're willing to do that. So in a way we have a choice right now as Wesleyans to say, do we just wanna be the nice, uh, nice kind of don't rock the boat kind of evangelical types? Or are we willing to be what one of our, one of our historians, Dr. Dayton, who just passed away, I was a part of his funeral recently, um, he said, you know, we're not a liberal or a conservative movement. We are a radical movement. Our history is in being radical. Our history is in saying we want to do the opposite of what the culture does if it's off track. So this is why our position on abortion could be seen as very radical in our culture today. And it's why our position, like I mentioned, with ministry, uh, women in leadership could be seen as radical and countercultural with a different group of people. We're not trying to just be nice and be calm. We're trying to say, we want to say what the Bible says and have that affect not only our discipleship, but the systems around us where we see injustice. This is why all of the different statements of the Wesleyan Church, the things that are in our discipline, the things that are our position statements, many of those are not easy. We're not just putting out things that say, hey, don't rock the boat. We're saying, hey, this is hard conversations and in every church and in every community and in certainly every nation around the world, uh, there are things that are countercultural about who we are and what it means to be Wesleyan. Yeah, and just to just to follow on from that, I mean, I I had a conversation with one of our young people um, and and asked them, you know, what they were thinking if I was going to be involved in this conversation, what they felt I should be saying, and 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 they said, you know, really clearly, um, as Christians, we have to stand for the oppressed. Um, really clear in his mind, um, really articulate in what he was saying. Um, racism is a sin, just really clear. In terms of biblical mandate, um, I'm taken to, to Luke 4. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives. And also 1 Corinthians 12, um, when I was listening in on one of these conversations uh, about a week ago, maybe a bit longer than that, uh, Reverend Kim, uh, there those verses about when one of the parts of the body is hurt, then we all hurt, is, has, is just still resonating with me and is, and is really critical. Um, but I, I agree with David. I, I think this is a time when we really need to be revisiting, reinforcing um, those Wesleyan roots um, and being clear that, you know, we stand for issues of social justice, not because it's trendy, um, but that's because of who we are as, as followers of Jesus. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think we have a good starting point, um, but it's important that we're not complacent with that, I think. Let me ask this to the panel. Uh, how is it that, as we talk about uh, biblical mandates and what we see, uh, the role of discipleship and faith formation in these issues, how is it that people of faith come up with differing answers and sometimes radically differing answers to um, how this impacts faith and how it impacts uh, our, our lives? Let me, let me throw that out to you, panel. I think one of the reasons is like we can become selfish, <laughs> like we, we can make it about us. Like, I mean, I think about the passage where one minute uh, Peter is called the rock, right, where he, you know, shares the revelation of who Jesus is and uh, and Jesus commends him. And then a few verses later, um, you know, he, he's basically called, you know, Satan getting behind me <laughs> because he's moved from this place of revelation to this place of preservation, to this place of my idea is more important than what God wants. And I think one of the challenges we have is, is we sometimes ebb and flow there. It, it takes me back to, you know, um, you know, the 1700s, particularly with people like George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards, who were like pillars of the faith. Uh, who were a part of this awakening, this, this spiritual revival 
but yet they were slave owners, right? It's, it's, it's amazing how we can, we can be revivalists at one level and then totally miss it in another space. And I think sometimes uh, we have to be honest about our blind spots and we have to be honest about our selfishness and sometimes honest about what I think Meredith was getting at is sometimes we get so close to the system, so close to the power that it will cost us too much to push back against it. And so as a result, we, we become complicit with it uh, instead of confronting it. And I think that's one of our greatest challenges right now, particularly in the American church. And I know we're gonna get into resources in a moment, but a great resource we're going through right now in our church is called The Color of Compromise by Jamar Tisby. And it walks through the church's complicity with racism from its inception. And it's just important that we have that frame of reference so that we're not uh, complicit, but that we're in a place of being radical and confrontational when something dishonors God. Marquise, mention that book again. Can someone get that into the uh, into the chat for us? Um, yeah, it's, um, it's actually, uh, it's called The Color of Compromise by Jamar Tisby. It's actually on uh, Amazon Prime and uh, right now media, uh, as I know a lot of our churches use uh, one of those resources. There's the book and then there's a video curriculum that goes with it. And so we're walking through the book and the video curriculum uh, right now. Very powerful. I want to ask our panel, our time is, is winding down for this, for this moment and we've got to get to resources in a moment. But before we do that, what can the church do to help its congregants navigate through these storms? I mean, every pastor is wanting to shepherd well in these times. Uh, every pastor is, uh, we have a, a diversity and variety of people in our churches. Uh, we have our own journey. What can the church do, regardless of whatever your position is, what can the church do to help its congregants navigate through these storms? So okay, I, I don't think that this is a one size fits all because ultimately ministry is contextual and every leader is going to have to understand her or his context for ministry. I think the thing that's common to all of us is to use scripture as a norming norm. So that kind of becomes the foundation for us of how we're going to address it and understand ultimately that our God is a God that both desires relationship with us, but also uses our interpersonal relationships with each other to transform us. And so every, for me, the answer would simply be, this is something that can't be ignored because to Cassius's point, this is a biblical mandate that we have to understand that racism is sin, so we need to address it. But how we address it, I think we're going to have to become very both contemplative as faith leaders, but also courageous and quite frankly, resourceful in how, how we deal, whether that's through small group dialogue, preaching series, inviting other churches in, as David has talked about in the beginning, I think it's going to be multifaceted in the way that we deal with this in our communities. That's locally, but I also think, and David has spoken to much of this, when you're dealing with denominational churches, I think the denomination also has a role to play in the general sense where they coalesce uh, faith leaders together from, from different uh, parts of the diaspora. And we begin to deal with these things and all. And then there is a message broadly so that we understand that while we are in the same tent, we're celebrating the diversity we have and giving faith leaders the room to work that out in their cultural context. The one thing I will say again is we can't ignore it because to ignore it is to empower it. Yeah, I'd also say just <clears throat> in working um, in working with people who are in all different places of readiness, I think it's really important for us to understand the spiritual kind of component of this. I think sometimes this conversation um, we get we we toss around sociological terms like white privilege that kind of stuff, uh, which are really important terms and can help us apprehend the truth. But I think for us to to want to apprehend the truth, that question of how much do I want to know the truth here, uh, that's a real that's a spiritual question that I think uh, particularly white America really has to reckon with right now. Um, you know, part of what's so uh, difficult about this moment for 
white people who are not used to thinking about racism is that place of feeling like, am I guilty of something that I personally didn't do? And, and to what extent should I be held accountable for something that I personally don't feel like I've done? Well, that question of like, how much am I willing to take a hard look at my life and see what's really there? Um, that's a really scary question. And we can do that <laughs> when we have a, a keen sense that we're deeply loved by God. That's a spiritual reality. So we have to, I think sometimes, uh, you know, some of my uh, young white students who have wound up in ministry sort of jump to the sociological level first and want to talk about like, there's white privilege, there's this, there's that, without doing that kind of spade work to say, are you ready to, to learn <laughs> now? And I think that's something that we really need to be, to be aware of doing. So. Uh, and I echo that. Um, I am from that camp as well. I think there is a spiritual work that needs to happen deep down in our souls. There has to be a revelation and a transformation that takes place uh, within us that we found we, we need to have come to Jesus meetings, right. right? With ourselves, we need to bring ourselves to the, to the altar and have a come to Jesus uh, meeting because the power of God is, is, uh, has to occupy a space to break the chains that have kept us bound for years and years and years that we continue to attribute and give power to the enemy that divides us as the church. There has not been unity. There has not been unification. And I think we have to face the reality of how that has worked itself into our lives, into our churches, into our denomination, because we must not be silent to the truth of our posture and our position during the Civil War. We have to embrace those realities as part of our story and what we glean and learn and how we repent and continue uh, to repent. I think the second thing for, for, for me is that church, institution, organizations, know where you're at. Just don't go, go shooting uh, out of nowhere, know where you're at. You know, uh, Santi's reference, a continuum. There's a, a taxonomy of cultural responsiveness. There's tools, there's assessment. You have to do it from the spiritual component and you have to do it with the tools that we have available. You can't plan to move forward if you don't know where you're at as a congregation because your starting point will be off. You, don't, you, you can't guess these kind of things. And those, this, this is the opportunity that we have to think about what are we doing from a spiritual level and what are we doing to put the systems in place that are gonna help us break the cycles? Wow, we are, we're, we're winding down here. Um, just resources, you wanna speak just a moment about resources uh, that might be available. I think in the chat room, there should be some book, a list of books that have emerged. Real briefly panel, is there any resource that you wanna point to uh, in this moment? There's a working document. Some of us in the multi-ethnic ministry world have, have I've been um, working through and on. And, and what I'll do is I'll send that out so that it can be available for the Thursday conversation. And um, it's a uh, Google Doc, but you can also have it uh, um, as a Word Doc. Um, and so that's, that's a really important. I think the other piece is to know what we're doing in the Great Lakes region. Uh, book studies, as well as uh, over the summer, we'll be filming, I mean, we'll be viewing five films over 10 weeks and uh, processing uh, those films just, just because the summertime is very difficult to read the books together because you're vacation one week and you miss. So we're going to be watching films and processing some of this. And so if you uh, want to know more about that, we'd love to have you jump in uh, with us there. And I'll, I'll make sure that Matt, Matthew has that information as well. If people are wanting to know more about the, the UK context, um, we need to talk about Race uh, by Ben Lindsay um, is, is a really helpful uh, book, Understanding the Black Experience from uh, uh, the Perspective of White Majority Churches. Um, uh, a book by uh, one of my old tutors, one of my old college tutors, um, Rejection, Resistance, and resurrection, uh, speaking out on racism in the church uh, by Mukti Barton. Um, and, and the final one, um, I think this is one that I got you, Pastor Kim, when you visited us uh, in England, Dread and Pentecostal, uh, a political theology for the black church in Britain um, by Robert Beckford. Um, so those, those may be helpful. Uh, in terms of people just wanting to uh, understand more about the UK context. 
We I'm are going sure. to be curating uh, a list. Heard a voice, go ahead. Oh, it's just, I don't, I'm not sure what's on the list that's being curated, but I just wanted to second Santis's recommendation of the color of compromise. Um, for me, what's very helpful about, and I've led that uh, discussion on that book with a couple of uh, groups, uh, majority white groups, is it really does a nice job of kind of, uh, I mean, it's a great history, but it kind of really lays out the clarity with which racism in America starts with distinct decisions that people make, but then it kind of carries on almost with its own steam. And um, there's these uh, affirmative decisions that are made in the beginning, but after that, it just kind of runs on silence and the challenge to kind of think through, okay, what can, this, this is not going to stop on its own accord. What's the role of the church in helping to stop it? Just be a very helpful book, I think, for people seeking to understand what systemic, you know, how this became systemic and what it might look like to begin to uproot the systems and change the systems. I think the last one I'll add is The Brown Church, uh, which was written by uh, Roberto Romero Chao. Um, uh, as a Hispanic, as a Latina, as a Puerto Rican, uh, you know, the, the, the composition of who I am is a Spaniard, is a Taina Indian, and is an African. That's what makes a Puerto Rican. And uh, the brown church coming together with the black church is a very, it, this is a very significant uh, time. While there's some differences in terms of the experiences that we have had, there's also a lot of similarities. And so looking at, at it from that perspective, I think it's another great resource to be able to add during this time. And I think one of the things a lot of people tuning in may have a resource that's been useful for them. Part of an inhumility, I mean, all of us are continuing to find resources and, and read new books and start new conversations. And so that um, place on the Wesleyan website where Wesleyans are sharing what they're doing also has a whole section called Intentionally Learn that many of the people actually on this call contributed to resources. And you can click those links. So if you just go to that website, uh, and or even just Google, uh, what can we do about racism and the Wesleyan church, you'll find it and be able to, uh, the nice thing about it is there's a section you can actually contribute something that's missing. If there's something that's been important to you or the people in your church, uh, you can add yours to the list and that can show up later uh, for other people to use because we're all here to help each other uh, continue to learn and, and guide each other. And let us not only read, because reading is good, but it's not enough on its own. We have to engage with the reading and it has to move us in, into action. There has to be a cognitive and a behavioral change that takes uh, place and let's do it together. Yeah, and I, th I think the other thing I'd say, um, the CMAS staff have all been trained in cultural intelligence um, through the Cultural Intelligence Center. And so you have you know, what five or six uh, staff members who are able to do those trainings uh, some are also trained in unconscious bias. And so if there are ways in which uh, we can serve your district, region, or church, um, and I think we really would much rather train trainers <laughs> so that we don't have to come back, but um, just really pour into people who are indigenous to that particular area and can continue to do those kinds of trainings and development uh, after we're long gone. And we, we fill in the gap with you. a few others. <laughs> I want to highlight uh, just two next steps of, to remind you, the slide's going to come up, our secondary conversation. We, we're, we're, this is just the beginning. It's not a one and done conversation. So join us on, uh, on, on Thursday. We're gonna, our panelists will be back. We're going to be off. Uh, we're going to be in a private Zoom room, so we'll be able to just freely and safely engage uh, even more of your questions and uh, a diversity of opinions. So join us on Thursday. Uh, also, there's going to be uh, coming out of headquarters is another uh, webinar that is converse, how to talk about racism. And this is our Wesleyan Publishing House that will be putting on that webinar on Wednesday, July 8th. And so that's going to be another great conversation that leads to um, a resource, multi-ethnic conversations that some of you have used. But that's going to be a great conversation. I want to say thank you to all of our panelists for your time and for sharing. I wanna say thank you to all of you. This is, it's not an easy conversation. It's not a, a, a quick conversation, but we, we have begun and this was our family talk. We're gonna continue it on Thursday, but thank you. We wanna have our hearts just open to, uh, to this moment. And what, what is God asking us uh, to do in this moment? 
And uh, so I just, I just thank you uh, again. It's not, it's not easy to be part of a conversation like this, but thank you for doing it. And we're looking forward to our continued discipleship conversation and for making disciples who make disciples. God bless you for the rest of the week. All righty, guys. Oh, my goodness. Good job.